you guys go ahead and have a seat and open up your Bibles to the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And you remember last week we were in chapter 3 learning about this great miracle that took place as a result of Peter's second sermon. And they were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. And they were going through the gate beautiful. And there was a man who was lame, had been that way from birth. For over 40 years he had been there. And he looked at Peter and John as they were going in to worship at the hour of prayer. And he looked at them expecting to receive something from them. But his expectations were Far too low. See, God was going to give him more than just spare change. He was going to give him new life, not just physically, but spiritually as well. And what a story that is. What a picture that is of how the Lord can take us from being beggarly to being true believers. And it is because of the power of the name of Christ. And that was really the, the uh, became sort of the basis for Peter's third sermon that we're going to see today. We're going to um, talk about something that is very relevant to our lives. The thing you need to understand about the Christian life is if you're doing it the way Christ did, if, if you're living the way Christ lived, uh, you're going to see some wonderful things. You're going to see God work in miraculous ways. You're going to see transformation in you. And as God works through you, you, by his grace, will get the opportunity to see the transforming work through your life to have influence in other people's lives. And it's a wonderful thing. But know this. As a result of that work of God in and through you, there's another work that's going on. Wherever God is doing a work, Satan is doing a work and vice versa. Wherever Satan is working, God is working. There is, the Bible tells us, a spiritual battle that takes place in, in, in the heavenly realms. And we need to be aware of it and we need to understand how to respond to it. And that's what we're going to see in this chapter. As the Holy Spirit at Pentecost gave birth to this thing we know today called the church, and God began to work in amazing ways and miraculous ways, and just like was true in the life of Christ, the miracle set up the message. That was the point. And there's a message that Peter has preached now twice, and, and he's going he's gonna to proclaim the gospel yet again this third time. The message that, that God wants these people to hear. But there's going to be resistance. There's going to be pushback. There's going to be severe opposition. We are going to see here in Acts chapter 4 the persecution of the church. This is where it starts. It started then and it has continued without really any break for the last 2,000 plus years years. But this is where it all starts. I've entitled the message this morning, Suffering for the Gospel. We're going to look at um, the first section of scriptures, uh, verses 1 through 12. If you brought your Bible this morning, and I hope you are in the habit of doing that, let's read together in verse 1. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, and being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power, by what name have you done this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, 
If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he's been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That verse we finished in, verse 12, is one of the greatest gospel verses in all of the Bible. All of the New Testament for sure. There is no other name by which we must be saved. And we're going to get to that. But as I said, the subject this morning in this passage is one that is, it's hard. It's hard to talk about. It's certainly hard to endure in this life. But the fact of the matter is there is suffering in this life. More specifically, there's suffering for the sake of the gospel. It is par for the course. It is something to be expected. Jesus talked about it. The disciples certainly wrote and talked about it and lived it out for us to see. Their lives are an example. Indeed, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, there is what we know as the hall of faith. Lives of men and women, saints of old, who lived and died in faith. And their lives bear testament to the fact that it can be done even in the most extraordinary circumstances. And that's what we are seeing on display here. The history of persecution in the church begins in Acts chapter 4. And that first decade, historically, if you were to do your own homework and, and look at things historically, you would see that there are at least five major persecutions that happened within the first decade of the church. Bear in mind that these are new believers. The church is only weeks old. They don't even have a building. It's incredible to think about what the church was. It just exploded onto the scene by the power of the Holy Spirit. And these people began to be witnesses. And as we have learned in our study, when we focus on being the church, God builds the church. That's his job. Our job is to be the church. And as we learn by God's grace and through the truth of his word, what it practically means to walk out this Christian faith and live the way Christ lived, God does something powerful. But just understand that part of being the church means that just like the church throughout history, we're going to suffer and we don't like it, but we need to learn how to suffer well. I say that I have, I have observed that, um, <laughs> That this is one of the doctrines of the faith, one of the promises of the Bible that we don't tend to rush to, to claim. In this world, you will have tribulation. I claim that in the name of Jesus, you know. We, <laughs> we don't want to talk about that so much. Let's just kind of keep that on the down low. You know, but the fact is, we are in good company. They persecuted the prophets. God still sent them. Not everybody listened to the prophets. They still came. They still, still preached the message. And it was true in the early church through the apostles and Jesus himself. And it's just part of the reality that we must embrace in a fallen world. And we can do it well. I'm not saying we embrace it as if we like it or we look, you know, I mean, Maybe some people are a little strange that way, but uh, I'm not saying that, that, that we uh, need to accept it in that sense. But the fact of the matter is there's a lot of persecution. There always has been. If you fast forward through that first century and the first few centuries of the church, you see that um, there were at least 10 major waves of, of persecution. And it was just as, about as terrible as, as you can imagine. And, and of course, the reason is because Satan has always hated Christ. So he's always hated Christians. And, and that is just the reality that is going on. But even as I preach this message, this isn't sort of a doom and gloom, despairing kind of a message. It's really not. It is a message of hope. And we'll see that as we go through uh, this uh, section today, but in, in the chapters, in the weeks and months ahead, uh, we of all people have every reason in the world to be people of, of hope. 
And that comes with the message of the gospel. But, but we have to accept and understand that uh, we're going to suffer for the sake of the good news, the, the message that Christ brought us to share. There were a number of emperors, of course, throughout Roman uh, history, and, and um, uh, Nero was one of them, just a, an incredibly wicked man, uh, followed by Diocletian and others. And, and they sort of perfected the art of torture. It was the Romans. Uh, well, I can't remember if it was the Romans, but they certainly, they certainly perfected it. I can't remember, uh, was it the Assyrians that started crucifixion? I, I don't remember. It doesn't matter. But the point is, they perfected this stuff. And so, throughout the history of the church, they would do some of the most bizarre things. They would, they would sew Christians up in animal skins and put them out uh, and to be, you know, eaten by wild dogs and these sorts of things. Uh, one of the emperors uh, made human torches, impaled Christians and covered them in wax and lit them on fire and his gardens. And, and you think of this stuff, it's just hard to even fathom. To this day, do you know that there are some 100, probably 100 million Christians in the persecuted church today around the world? It's continuing. And we see it. We see it in our culture. It's coming close to home more and more. And, and if, if you don't believe that, then you have got your head buried deep in the sand. Just within the last couple of years, we had someone, uh, you know, come into a church and, and nine people were killed, including the pastor. And I, I, I'll be honest, I think about this stuff sometimes. Not very much and not very long. I don't like to think about that. But the fact of the matter is we live in a dangerous world. But as I said, we're not without hope. And one of the distinctive characteristics of people who know and trust their Bible isn't simply that they have hope, that because of hope, we're also bold. There's a boldness to being Christians. It's required if we're going to follow Christ. But there's a whole range of persecution that we experience. It can be, of course, lethal kinds of things that we've alluded to and even described, but it can also be, uh, you know, something far less than that. Maybe just a, a social outcast. We, we experience alienation and rejection from others in our family or, or our friends or the workplace or at school. And, you know, we become a Christian and we're excited about it, but not everybody's excited about it. Why? Because of what's going on in the spiritual realm. It's very convicting to people when someone they know and love starts living for Christ. And it's not always uh, real easy to accept for them. So Jesus said, in this world, you will have persecution. Paul said later in his writings, the godly in Christ will suffer persecution. And, and so we need to understand, okay, Lord, if this is part of the journey, our faith journey in this life, show us how to do it, do us, do it well and help us understand why it matters. Um, and the first point that I want to make as, as we sort of look at this today is if you're a note taker, just jot it down. Accept persecution graciously. Notice that they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day. And there's no hint anywhere in the text that they put up a fight. <laughs> you know, they didn't take up arms. <laughs> now, this is a significant change. Remember Peter in Gethsemane? I mean, he came out swinging. He had said before that night, he said, you know, all of you wimps might deny the Lord, but I never will. You know, as he just thinks he is going to stand up for the Lord. I'm willing to die for the Lord. And then all of a sudden, his big moment comes and, and, and Jesus says, Peter, put that down before you hurt yourself. You know, <laughs> don't you know that I can call 12 legions of angels? I don't need your help. Jesus stood before Pilate, even Pilate, very arrogantly, very blinded by Satan, said, don't you know I have the power to take your life? He says, excuse me, you don't have any power at all but what my father has given you. Nobody takes my life. I lay it down. If you want a good reason as to why we can say with a straight face and a, and a resolute heart, I accept persecution graciously. Well, there's one right there. It, it's a powerful thing. 
Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under restraint. Jesus restrained his power. Why? Because he was laying down his life sacrificially. And that is the point. There's nothing more powerful than sacrificial love. It is, in fact, what changed the world. We would not be sitting here today as believers in church as we know it. In fact, the Western civilization wouldn't even exist as we know it were it not for the Christian community, the gospel of Christ, the example of Jesus and his followers. It would change the world. It's just a historical fact. But I'll say this. This was hard to write down. I'm taking notes. I'm saying, okay, what's point number one? Uh, uh, submit to persecution. Hmm. <sighs> really, Lord, that's what you want me to say right out of the gates? <laughs> That's not going to win friends and influence people, you know. And, and it's hard to preach this message, I got to tell you. And, you know, I'll say this. You're not being honest with yourself if there's not something in you that wells up to push back. It's, it's just, I, I admit it. Submit to persecution? Wait a minute. Am I reading my Bible correctly? Are you serious? What do you, what? Like, like, what is that? We just let evil run amok? Is, is that the answer to the problem of evil? We, we, don't, we don't stand for justice in this world. We, I mean, what does this really mean? What are the implications of this? And, and what I want you to understand, the reason this is so powerful is because Jesus wasn't turning a blind eye to evil. He certainly wasn't just sort of passively sitting there, you know, as if he didn't care or it wouldn't matter or it wasn't worth it. No, 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 no. The principle in scripture is we don't turn a blind eye to evil. We overcome evil. With good. Love conquers hate, Jesus said. He said, Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you and spitefully use you. In our minds, though, honestly, it sounds like total insanity, does it not? It's totally counterintuitive. Like, who does that? Who even thinks like that? God does. And this is what makes Jesus so attractive to me. Why I love him so much is he came into this world and he led by example. And he was willing to suffer what? Persecution. But even he, as a human being, pushed back a bit. He, in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember, what did he say? Father, if, there, if it's possible, if there's any way, let this cup pass. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He said, I always do the will of my father. And so when, when I say sub, you submit to persecution or you accept persecution graciously, you're not submitting to evil. You're submitting to good. You're submitting to love. You're submitting to God. You, 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 it's not a place. You're not living from a place of weakness. You're, you're living from a place of strength. Because when, when Christians are willing to live and even die, if necessary, for their faith, it has a power, tra powerful transforming effect in the world. Have you ever mistreated someone only to have them return in in kindness? You ever had that experience? You mistreat someone and they're just totally gracious back to you. What does it do? What's the effect on you? I'll tell you, and history bears this out, not always. But many times, it's very convicting. The Bible says it's the grace of God that draws men to repentance. There's a point where you just realize, what am I doing? Why am I fighting this loving, gracious, patient, long-suffering, merciful God? And, and it's very disarming. And, and it's, there's a point where, you know, it's hard to fight God. You have to fight him to your dying breath because he loves you so much. And sacrificial love is the most powerful force that has ever existed. It's part of why God describes himself this way. God doesn't just love. God is love. And, and it's, it's what we need to understand. And, and these people, the, the priests in the temple guard and the Sadducees, they came upon them and, and they began the persecution. They had to do something. You understand? Politically and... and uh, Socially, what was going on, it was unacceptable to them. 
Um, it'd be sort of like if uh, you and, say, 10,000 of your friends showed up at a synagogue and said, you know, we're going to uh, start a class on New Testament theology this Sunday <laughs> or Saturday. It just wouldn't go over very well. And this is the setting. All of these baby on fire Christians, they're there. They don't have a building. Where, where, where do they gather? They gather at the temple uh, courts around the temple. If you've ever been there, it's, it's a massive piece of landscape. And, uh, and there was a Solomon's porch, the colonnade there, the covered area. And so literally thousands of people could congregate there. And so that's what they did. And they listen to Peter's preaching, and it's just a buzz. I mean, thousands of people are talking about this, this, this man named Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. They probably had small groups and prayer things going on, and everybody's talking about this. Well, it's a problem. Because they're doing it on someone else's turf. These are the spiritual leaders in Israel. And all of a sudden they look out and there's just, I mean, it was bad enough when Jesus came at the beginning of his ministry. And then again, at the end of the ministry, and remember he saw the corruption that was going on and it says he made a whip and, and he, he just overturned the money changers tables. And, uh, he made a big scene and that got their attention. You remember what they said to him? Who do you think you are? Where, where does your authority come from? Well, they're going to ask these guys the same thing. By what authority do you do this? Oh, they gave Peter the open door when they asked that question. They handed him his text on a silver platter. He began quoting the scriptures and talking about their prophets. And I mean, they couldn't say anything. We'll get to that next time. But, but the point is these people came and they, they just, they took him away. Why did they do that? Well, the, the, um, the priests, you remember, were the people that were in charge of um, the sacrificial system and, and all of that that went on there. And so they were kind of, uh, you know, and, and here these guys are preaching Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You don't need to do that anymore, all that sacrificing stuff. So there's sort of a conflict of interest there on the Temple Mount. And, um, and then there were the temple guards, you know, Rome... Uh, the Roman Empire, part of the reason they were able to be so successful is because they were so tolerant. They, when they'd conquer someone, they allowed them to continue to practice their faith. I mean, they kind of left the Jews alone for the most part, as long as they didn't create a big problem. But there were these insurrectionists, these uprisings. There were people, zealots that were pushing back against Rome that would, you know, crop up from time to time. And so they had a police presence. They had temple guards. They had people there. And, and Romans were all about order, law and order. <laughs> and they wanted to keep things under control. And the Sadducees were an interesting group of people. They were the liberals of the day. And they didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in the resurrections. They didn't believe in all the stuff that these guys were preaching. And again, these guys show up at their church and start <laughs> preaching this stuff. It's a problem. And, you know, Jesus was the center, this risen Christ. They're preaching the resurrection. And, and the word on the street uh, there were all kinds of people who had seen it, had heard about it, and, and seen the risen Christ. So it was very clear. There was no question that Jesus had risen. They weren't trying to prove it wrong. They were just trying to cover it up and make it go away. They just want people talking about it. That's why they were so sad, you see. So. <laughs> Sadducees. Okay, I just want to make sure you're still awake and tracking with me. Uh so that's what's going on. But they were really the, the power brokers. I mean, in terms of they oversaw all this stuff that was going on in the temple. And they were people of influence. They were very wealthy. They were prominent, powerful people. Uh, you know, they, many of them made up the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish kind of the equivalent of their Supreme Court. And so all of a sudden, these apostles get thrown in the middle of all of this. Can you imagine how intimidating that must have been? They are there before all of these people of position and power and influence. And, you know, I think I probably would have been, you know, looking down and mumbling and I wouldn't really know what to say. But they had this holy boldness and it was because the resurrection was real. They were preaching a message that was true. 
they were living as if Jesus is alive because he is. And, and uh, these baby Christians God used in such a, a powerful way. And it wasn't just that they taught people this stuff. It was what they taught. And it, it says they were disturbed, greatly disturbed. Oh, they were agitated. But again, um, we, we have to be willing to do the same thing to overcome evil with good. Can God, do, can God allow short-term evil in order to bring about long-term good? Oh, he does it all the time. I mean, we know it through history and, and biblical history, church history, of course. But you and I uh, have a great example of this. Just recently, over the last few years, we were praying like crazy for Pastor Saeed Abedini, who was in prison in Iran. You remember that? I mean, it was, it was always on our radar. And, and the global church came together and, and just prayed fervently for his release. And he became sort of the poster child for the persecuted church. So we were just praying for Saeed and his family. We were praying for the whole persecuted church. And I was talking to Nagme, his wife, uh, when we had her come and speak. And she was, she was saying that she had the opportunity to speak on Al Jazeera TV. And the gospel went out literally to millions of people in the Islamic world. Because her husband was in prison. And so we may sit there and say, it's just unjust. It's so unfair. And God, why? He says, well, you know, if you could see what I see, it wouldn't seem so insane. It wouldn't seem so unreasonable. The fact that you can't see what God can see, uh, be careful that you don't jump to premature conclusions. You don't start charging God with being unfair or not good or not powerful or not caring. There's a lot of evil in this world. But listen, God's going to make it all right. He's going to set things straight. The fact that he, he delays his coming doesn't mean he's asleep at the wheel. It means he's merciful. He doesn't desire that any should perish. And so that's why we proclaim the good news of the gospel. Because God in his mercy wants the world to know. But, it, but because there is spiritual opposition, we have to embrace, like our Savior, graciously embrace suffering as part of the potential process for us. And, and, and I think we're thrilled to see that Saeed was released, but many, many others are not. And, and a lot of times people will not see in their lifetime why it's important to accept persecution graciously. If you just stop the story in any single individual's life who is suffering for the, for the sake of Christ, if you were to stop at any point along the way and, and they don't get to see the end of the story, it'd be premature and you'd come to wrong conclusions. But you know, God is working. And, and I, I think in my own life of, of an example of this with my own mother years ago, um, I never knew my grandmother, but I met her one time when I was about four years old. And I remember her in her wheelchair. She was uh, uh, wheelchair bound by the age of 35. She had rheumatoid arthritis. She died at 65. She was a very quiet, sweet woman. And I, I just, I never, like I said, I never knew her. But my mom told me about her. And uh, she was a woman of prayer. And she prayed faithfully for her kids. She prayed for my mom. But she was married to a, a very angry, violent, abusive man. I mean, he was just a tyrant. And he beat them. And um, <clears throat> it, was, it was tough growing up in my mom's family. So much so that at the age of 13 or maybe 14, she packed her little bag and she walked out the door never to look back. Running from this crazy father that she had. She loved him, but it was so oppressive to live under that abuse. And by the age of 17, she was pregnant. And her story goes on. And if she were here today, she would, I wish she could tell it to you. It's an amazing story. But as far as her mother knew, that baby girl of hers was about as lost as lost could be. For, for the next couple of decades, she lived deep in the world, deep in sin. And she was known as the black sheep of her family. But she had a, um, a sister she calls St. Joanne. <laughs> and Joanne loved the Lord. And, and uh, she married a, a pastor. And they prayed for my mom for many, many years. And uh, continued when they talked to her to share the gospel with her. And she finally hit rock bottom in her life and became open to the gospel and uh, accepted Christ. And she led me to the Lord subsequently. And, 
and, uh, and discipled me in the Lord in my early days of my faith. And, and so I stand here before you now with the privilege of being your pastor. But um, I have a hunch that my grandma wept a lot of tears, probably feeling many times like God wasn't hearing her prayers. Wondering if all of her suffering was going to really matter in eternity. And yet it did. And her body was bound, but her prayers weren't. And I say this to you because for some of you, I just told your story. And you you understand. And and you've been through that. And and that suffering isn't for no purpose. I I don't know how God's going to fulfill. Maybe he'll show you in this life. Maybe he won't. In my grandma's life, she didn't get to see it. But I don't think she's complaining in heaven. And, and, and I say this to you because you may be in a difficult situation. You may be a, a, a believer married to a non-believer. Uh, you, may, you may be struggling with rebellious children. You may be dealing with, uh, you know, some difficult employer or employee or, or in a class at school where they're just, uh, the professor attacks Christians and Christianity. You, you may be given a lower grade like I was uh, in college when I uh, spoke up for Christ in a particular class. It just, it just got under the skin of my professor and I got a lower grade in the class because of it. And I know that because he told me. <laughs> and, and it's real. And, you know, I think in some measure, and I I say this, you know, unapologetically, but I want you to understand, I I say it in love. We got to toughen up in the church. We, We just must have thick skin but tender hearts. We must understand that if we're going to be the ambassadors of Christ that God has called us to be, then we can't be wimpy. And we complain so often. And I don't say, I'm not dismissing your suffering. I'm really not. But we got to keep it in perspective. Like it's no small thing, for example, if someone's in a difficult marriage and, and they're not being uh, persecuted physically to the point of death. That's, it's, you, you can't compare that, uh, you know, to someone who's getting their head lopped off in Iran. But it's certainly not a trivial thing. It's painful, but, but it's not pain without a purpose. There's something God will do through suffering if we embrace him in the midst of suffering. And whether it's just social ostracism or whether someday in God's providence you have a gun to your head, whatever the case may be, Jesus said, don't fear him who can kill the body, but after that can't do anything. Fear him who can cast both soul and body in hell fire. That's, that's kind of a wake-up call. He says, you want to, let me just put this in perspective for you. And, and we've, we've got to understand this. You have to be tough to be a Christian, not hard-hearted, not callous, not, you know, any of that fleshly stuff. But... But there's a strength that comes is absolutely necessary to walk the walk we're called to walk and talk the talk we're called to talk. The second point, the last two I'll I'll make more quickly, but um, verse 8, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, He understood through his own personal failure that when he sought to stand up for Christ, when he sought to do good things for Jesus, when he sought to, to minister in his own strength, what did he do? He fell flat on his face. He failed. He denied the Lord and ran just like everybody else when he was trying to do it in his own strength. But after Pentecost, being filled with the Holy Spirit, it was a different story. I cannot imagine. You know, I, I've been in court before, you know, for speeding ticket. <laughs> you know, I, I've been in court with other people. And I got to tell you, when I've been in court, even just little old Thurston County down here, you walk in there and it's kind of intimidating. 
You walk in and you're like, I don't want to be here. You know, it's even worse in jail or in the prisons. When I go and preach in the jail or in the prison, I walk in and it's just like, lock up. And you're like, ah, 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 you know, and you're there with all these people and, and, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, I can't imagine living here. It's a dangerous place. This guy is, is, finds himself surrounded by the, the Supreme Court. Hey, talk about jail ministry. God, when else are you going to have the, pot, the, the, the opportunity to preach the gospel to the Supreme Court? I mean, it's pretty cool when you think about it. God's getting it done. But it's through what? Persecution. And, and, and these guys aren't having influence in their culture the way God intended them. You see how the, the, can you connect the dots with our world today? You see our nation that was founded on biblical principles. You see what's going on in our nation today. And people in the highest positions of responsibility in this land. Judges are legislating from the bench. They're passing terrible laws that are, that are a reflection of our culture, which is going down the tubes because we have rejected Christ. And, and it's intimidating to stand in the face of our culture right now. But stand, we must. But we must do it in love. Amen. And a lot of, of what sometimes is done in the name of the Holy Spirit is nonsense, and it does not reflect the love of Christ. Amen. People say, oh, are you spirit-filled, brother? You know, and they do all these bizarre things in the name of the Holy Spirit. Listen, if you're going to do that, fine. Just don't tag Jesus. Amen. Amen. Don't, don't do it in the name of the Holy Spirit. We are not to be bizarre. We are to love faithfully and preach the truth in love faithfully. Jesus said before he went to the cross, he said, listen, um, there's going to come a day when you're taken before kings and governors for my name's sake. There's coming a day when you're going to be persecuted for the sake of the message that I have preached to you. And, and you're going to be afraid, but he says, listen, don't worry about what you're going to say. Don't worry about it. I'll give you, the Holy Spirit will give you exactly what to say. This is this, the thing about persecution. If we, if we think too much about it, we start to get scared and, and we were, what would I do? What would I say? And he says, don't worry about it. If you need dying grace someday, he'll give you dying grace someday. If you need the courage to speak boldly uh, for Christ in a tough situation, he'll give it to you, but not apart from his spirit. You have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I've told you before, when you talk about being filled with the, the spirit, I want to just boil it down to, to what it simply is in all of its glory and power. The fruit of the spirit is what? Love. Love. The power of the Holy Spirit working through your life is for the purpose of loving well and preaching this gospel and being the witness in this dark world that we're called to be. And it's, it's something that, uh, that the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail. When you be the church, God will build the church. And, and we can't be praying for a great awakening, a great spiritual awakening in America if the church is asleep. We need revival in the church. We need, it starts, it's not before it ever happens on a national scale. It has to happen on an individual scale. And, and so all of us have to take this to heart. But Jesus said further, he said, you know, he gave a little proverb, a little story. He said, you know, there's 12 hours in a day. You can't make the day longer and you can't make the day shorter. It just is what it is. Here's what you can do. Redeem the time. Live the day for the purpose for which I gave you that day to live. And, and when you do that, the Holy Spirit will work through your life in a powerful way. And the question is not how much of the Holy Spirit do you have, but how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? Okay, we're talking about lordship. If you want to experience the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit pulsating through your life in a way that, that, that influences your friends, your family, even strangers, if you want to be the church and experience the power of the Holy Spirit, then that means there has to be real repentance on our part. Remember, no repentance, no refreshing. 
That was last week's message. He said, if, if you repent, times of refreshing will come. Times of revival, times of restoration, times of national healing will come. But we have to repent first. How much of you does the Holy Spirit have? Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why God was using him. He believed in the resurrection and preached it. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit instead of his own efforts. He was doing it in the strength of the Lord. Last point, I'll close with this. Boldly use persecution as an opportunity for the gospel. That's what verses 8 through 12, when he starts to, to address them and preach his third sermon, that's what he's doing. He's boldly using persecution as an opportunity for the gospel. Listen, the Bible says that sin takes opportunity. Did you know that? Romans 7, you can go read it for yourself, but that's one of the characteristics of our sinful nature is it's opportunistic. Satan is certainly opportunistic. You know what that says to me? As a follower of Jesus, I also need to be opportunistic. See, that's what Peter's doing. He, he's no longer running and hiding. He says, oh, goody. And he just, he, he just lets the lion out of the cage. Truth will defend itself. The gospel will defend itself. We don't have to worry about the response of people and how they react or respond. We just are there to, to just, just give it to them. And that's what he did. We don't try to be seeker friendly. We tried that in America. It didn't work. It was a colossal failure. We are not to be seeker friendly. Now, of course, we need to be friendly to people, but we don't compromise. See, the problem in the church in America today is, is not so much, a, um, you know, people are denying the faith and walking away. They're just compromising. Because we don't, we don't suffer, you know, the threat of death, you know, we, we don't stand up and renounce the faith like people were called to do in Rome. Say Caesar is Lord and they would say, no, Jesus is Lord. And we're not in that situation at this point. But, you know, what, what happens in us is, is we just compromise. We get a little pushback, you know, at school or at work or among family and friends. And we just kind of go silent. We, we don't want to make any waves. We just don't want, you know... And, and, and we want to, but see, that's, that's, that is the antithesis of the gospel. We shouldn't be obnoxious or rude or unkind. We shouldn't be any of that. We should be gracious. We should, we should, we should be kind and charitable in the way we speak to people, but don't compromise. We're not called to compromise and don't give up. Don't give up, stand up. Don't give up, speak up. Don't give up, suit up. Put on the whole armor of God. Don't give up, look up. Your redemption draws nigh, the Bible says. We are living in the last days. Do you believe it? We're living in the last days. Our time is short. And he just addressed these people in a very direct way. He confronted their sin. He said, you put to death the prince of life. Well, that took some guts. And then he says, there's salvation in no other name. That means there's not salvation in, in the name of, uh, in, in, you know, any philosophy of life, uh, uh, Buddhism, uh, Confucius, Muhammad, Allah, uh, Joseph Smith. There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. And that would even include, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, that would even include names like Abraham, <laughs> Moses. See, that's what they would have been thinking. They were very religious. They thought because of their religious traditions and systems and heritage, they were in. And Jesus comes along and says, just blows that out of the water and says, no, no, if you reject me, you're not in. There's no other name. And so, as I close I want to acknowledge that, that as we look around the world today, there's a lot to be afraid of. There's a lot to be sad about. We, we see the things going on on the news and it just makes our heads spin. And rightly so. But we're not without hope. We're not without power. We're, we're not without purpose. God put us here for just such a time as this. 
As the world grows worse, as people become more hopeless, as more extreme things happen, people are going to have questions and they're going to need answers. And they're going to, God's going to put them just like he did with Peter. He just hands it to him on a silver platter. He says, here's the opportunity. And we need to be ready for that, church. We really do. We need to make sure our lives are right with the Lord and we need to be prepared and proactive and say, Lord, use me. Just use me. This is a crazy world, but full of opportunity. We need to equip our kids. We need to raise them up in the Lord. They're going to grow up in this crazy world too if the Lord should tarry. Show them how it's done. They're going to deal with sin. They're going to deal with their own sinful hearts. They're going to deal with the Satan. They're going to deal with the world. Show them how it's done. We, we, they need to be equipped. Christians need to be radical and full of hope and boldness. John's, or Jesus said in John's gospel, he said, they, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. I'm looking down here at my sweet brother and sister, our missionaries from Belize. And uh, this came home in a personal way to them. Uh, they're home on furlough for a while, but they've been through some things down there in Belize. You know, you think Belize, you think vacation. Let, let me just help you. It's not, okay? <laughs> what they're doing is not a vacation. They've been held at gunpoint. They've been robbed. They, they've gone through some terrible things down there, being persecuted for the name of Jesus. And I know they wouldn't change it. I know it hasn't been fun, but I know today they would be the first people to stand up and say, God has been faithful. It's totally worth it. We see God working. And even where we can't figure out maybe what he's doing, we know he's doing something because this is his whole, he's writing the script and, and he's building his kingdom. We just want to be used. And so I encourage you as you go from this place, uh, remember these three principles. We, we got to be spirit filled. We've got to embrace the Lord in persecution and we've got to see the opportunities God puts before us or we will not be a part of what he's doing in this world. And it's a wonderful thing to be a part of what he is doing, but we can't be timid. I was at a dinner the other night and I, you know, I, 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 I failed in this way. Um, I had been praying that the Lord would give me an opportunity to share with someone. And I was sharing with, a, I was having dinner at kind of this little formal dinner thing at this community event. <laughs> I was sitting next to a lady and I'm just praying, okay, Lord, give me, you know, just give me the open door and help me to listen and ask good questions. I was trying to do that. It's hard. You guys know it's hard for me to listen. I want to preach. And so I'm listening. I'm asking her questions. I'm asking her questions. And I felt like the Lord said, okay, now, but then I looked, I was timid. I was like, like, like right now there's all these people and I, I and, and I start to kind of have a little panic inside. And, and so I, I missed it. And, and don't you know, in 30 seconds, this woman starts telling me about Buddhism and she says, you know, there's this guy Eckhart Tolle, you need to read his book. And she's trying to convert me to Buddhism. And it was like the Holy Spirit said, Johnny, you snooze, you lose. <laughs> she's trying to convert the pastor. It was, it's, <laughs> oh. I couldn't believe it. Just hung my head and went out like, okay, Lord, I get it. <laughs> anyway, why don't you stand together with me? Lord, we are thankful that you came into this world and you willingly suffered because something at the end of the day would make it all worth it. You're, you're redeeming lost people. You're, you're calling them to salvation and and, and Lord, um, we are thankful that we can look at this world through the lens of scripture and see that there's a purpose to it all. And Lord, I, I pray that if any here are just really struggling, they're suffering, maybe not persecution, but just maybe suffering and failing, uh, just having a hard time trusting that you do have a purpose, that there's something someday, there's something you're up to they just can't see and that they're losing heart. I pray that you'd give them hope, Lord. Remind them once again that you are at work in and through their life. You will not fail them. And Lord, when they're with you in glory, they'll see and, and it'll all be worth it. Help us, Lord, to be strong in the faith because of this message. Lord, help us not shrink back from the hard things, but to just embrace you a little bit more through it. And Lord, we just thank you that you demonstrated such sacrificial love. It helps us trust you knowing that you understand and that you care and that you're more powerful than any trouble we will ever face. Help us to be people who go into our community 
equipped with the gospel and with the power of the Holy Spirit and with the love of Christ so we can change our world. We ask this for your name and your glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be dismissed. If you'd like prayer, please come forward. God bless you.